my name is Todd Walker. I'm uh, from Texas. Uh, I've lived in most parts of the state, but uh, right now I currently live in Blanco, Texas. It's north of San Antonio, in between Austin and San Antonio. A certified journeyman. You know, the, the very essence of the mental game is this. The only reason that the event matters is because we make it matter. Welcome to the Mullins Farrier Podcast. Every horse, whatever it was doing, had a season. Once their competition season finished, they took the shoes off, they chucked it out in the field with some other horses, and it had a two, maybe three months period where it went and remembered what being a horse was all about. Even in a cheaper area, your prices should be set by your skill level, by your experience. And some people might not feel that they're worth, you know, as much as others. But if you're only charging $160 to shoe a horse, then the only way you're making money is on your trims. The WCB was a way to, to make sure that you kept the trade alive. I think I'm a custodian of the trade, so it's like we have to keep it going. It was hard, but, you know, you adapt and overcome, and that probably gets to me where I am now. It's problem solving, horseshoeing's problem solving, and back in the day it was problem solving how to be as strong as the older apprentices. So it's all about adapting and overcoming, which was good. I know we learn every day, but you do have to put yourself outside the box and I'm just continue to learn, which is why I was just trying to do my fellowship because I still have apprentices. And if I stay at my AW, I'm stagnant. Welcome everyone. Just a little shopkeeping before we start here. Dr. Simon Curtis is hosting another webinar on Wednesday the 13th of March. Laminitis 3. Professor Chris Pollitt, the world's leading authority on laminitis, which is the second biggest cause of death in horses, is the guest speaker on this one. We need to know more to tackle this issue in both preventative measures and treatments. To make the most of having Chris Pollitt on board, with his extraordinary knowledge on this subject, he will be the sole speaker for this webinar. Use the discount code MULLINS, all caps, upon checkout to receive a 25% discount on tickets. There is also a small number of early bird priced tickets available, which will give you a double discount. I don't know if you need access to the email link for that, but I do know you have to order them before the early bird end date of the 29th of February to get the double discount. If you need the link, just reach out to me and I will send it to you. Go to eventbrite.com and search for the Laminitis 3 webinar to get your tickets. On a related note, I just returned back from a vacation to the Azores with the Misses and I started and finished Simon Curtis's book, The Swordsmith, while on that trip. While I'm sure most of you are familiar with Dr. Simon's textbooks on farriery, you may not be aware of his talent for writing page-turning historical fiction. I was hooked from page one, and I highly recommend it. Look for it on Amazon or at your local farrier supply. Today's episode is another one that came out of my visit to the World Championship Blacksmiths Competition in Calgary, Alberta. I got to meet Todd for the first time in person while we were both in the periphery of the WCB tent, watching as the competitors had their goes. Todd agreed to do an interview and we found a quiet spot up on the balcony of the Farrier's Lounge. And as soon as I pressed record, music started playing and announcements were made in the speakers overhead. So I apologize for some of the noise. Heather over at Twisted Spur worked her magic again and turned my atrocious recording into something listenable. As you will hear, Todd and I had a wide-ranging conversation covering everything from his apprenticeship with the infamous Poor family his multiple experiences as a member of the American Farriers team and the WCB team, and his decision to step back from competing to focus on his young and growing family. For Todd, it has been an incredible journey, and it isn't over yet. 
I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Been on the America Farriers team six times and the World Championship Blacksmiths team twice. Okay. So that's my credentials there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, it, it's funny. American folks, most of them that I talk to, they do tend to move around a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I didn't much as a, a youth, but as an adult, yeah, I think I've moved around. Until I finally found a place in the Hill Country, and I really like the Hill Country of Texas. And Okay. It's, it's pretty, and I find that the horse's feet are a happy medium in between wet and rock hard that was my next so, question it's almost cheating i think <laughs> it's like i don't have to deal with overly wet or overly dry i got like right now they're pretty dry but they're not not too bad yeah so when we know rain will come and all will get back to kind of normal <laughs> and get a good balance but we're in a drought right now so right yeah i heard that yeah all the rain that should have been coming your way is been landing in my province for, right yeah and we had rain every other day this summer so right <laughs> funny how that works now you had said just before we started this that you did a presentation where it was almost like a biographical journey yeah i kind of put together a clinic and uh it was more along of avenues that farriers can take and and i'm not going to say that there's any wrong avenue i just shared my avenue and it was in all phases of my career which avenue and uh there's avenues for beginners there's avenues for novice people there's avenues for um, people that have been shoeing for 10 years and then avenues you could take in your later part of of shoeing uh, what are you going to do when you're done shoeing you got to think of something right yeah i feel like the lifespan of a farrier can for the most part is not something that's going to last you your whole life just because it's such a physically demanding job mm -hmm. I don't know farriers that have shot into their 70s, but they're they're rare. Yeah. I just feel like maybe what are some of the avenues that other farriers take? And so I did this clinic on the, the avenues that I've taken. And I wasn't saying it was right or it was wrong. It was just a, a look at the inside of, and I feel very blessed at the people that have steered me in my avenues of, I feel like I've had a, a wonderful career as a farrier. And I'm still, uh, every time, something just comes up and just steers me in another direction. And, and I'm like, God, man, this is such a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful job, right. wonderful career. Yes. It's demanding. Yes. It's hard on your body, but I've tried to leave the industry and I just get sucked back in <laughs> and I can't stay away for very long. I have not completely quit shoeing ever, right? but you know, I've slowed down. I'll pick up new horses and then I'll slow down. It's just, it's just a, a whirlwind. Yep. It's a lovely job. There's no other profession that I found that uh, has the camaraderie in between with farriers that are so willing to share knowledge. And they're their competitors. You yeah, know, we're awesome. competing for the same people. Right. That's what I like about the industry. Is so give you shirt off their back and then, or at a competition, they'll show you how to do everything and then go beat you. That's <laughs> like, how does well, that work? <laughs> that's been on full display here at the World Championships. Yeah. I, you see people striking for their fellow competitors and Correct. they're just in there helping them any way they can yeah. to beat them Correct. right and it's just considered normal right yeah and <laughs> yeah there, there are a lot of other places where i think it's a lot more cutthroat a lot of more i guess industries or careers yes. where it yes. would be you wouldn't even consider doing that right helping out your competitor get right. better yeah <laughs> so how did you become a farrier in the first place so I was going to college because that's what I was told to do. <laughs> you need to go to college so you can get a good job. Yep. I'm not a very good school person. I, I, I struggled in school. I had a hard time paying attention. I, there was other things on my mind and other places I wanted to be than sitting in a classroom. And I've always been a hands-on person. I, I like doing things with my hands and physical things. And so I was in my second year of college and I had changed majors probably three times, <laughs> four times, something. And whenever I would get to a, a point in college, I'm like, well, I'm not taking that class. Well, okay, well, you got to change your major. <laughs> <laughs> when all my electives were done and I had to do all my prerequisites were now due, yep. uh, I was like, maybe I should start exploring other options. And, uh, and I needed a break. So I, I took a summer and I got a summer job just as a, a camp counselor at a YMCA. 
Okay. Yep. And they had a string of horses, and and I knew a little bit about horses. Uh, I didn't have horses growing up, but I had cousins that had horses, so I, I'd, I'd ridden a horse, and, mm. and, and I loved horses. So, and they at the camp had asked if you know if I had any experience, and I said like, yes, I I know how to ride them, and I'm, I know my way around a horse. So I thought <laughs> my job there was to take children out on trail rides. And uh, that was my daytime position at the camp. And then after that, when the kids would get done with their activities, then I was camp counselor. Okay. So I was looking after anywhere from five to 15 children. And uh, we lived in a teepee <laughs> really? in, in Texas in the summer. So <laughs> <laughs> it's quite warm. Yeah. But it was, it was neat. So I went back to college after that summer and I was like hooked on the horses thing i couldn't get the horse thing out of him i was like all in on the horses i'm i wanted to do horses and so i felt like i was kind of hitting a brick wall with my academics and i was already preparing for the next summer i was like i want to i want to get a, another job kind of like this i don't know if i want to do the camp counselor thing but maybe like a dude ranch in colorado so i started researching some dude ranches and and i found a place and and i called them and they said well the job's yours if you know how to nail shoes back on it's like Oh, well, I know a farrier. <laughs> and I was like, so I was like, I'll get back with you. So I, I called my farrier friend up and said, Hey, will you show me how to tack a shoe on? It's like, sure. Yeah. And and, and he, I, little did I know, but he was just a backyard farrier. He, he didn't have very many horses. He just shot for some beer money or something, you know? And, and so he trimmed the foot and I thought that was pretty amazing. And then he shaped the shoe and, and he two nailed it. And then he let me drive the rest of the nails. And after I drove that first nail, I was amazed. I was like, this this is amazing. You can drive a nail <laughs> and a living animal and it comes out and it's, he's not hurt. It, he's not bleeding. You can do that. So I went back and I dropped out of all my college classes, moved back home. And I went into work for a farm and ranch uh, supply company, you know, and saved up my money to go shoeing school. Oh, okay. And the look on my dad's face when I got home <laughs> with all my stuff moving home from college and I told him my plan, he's like, you're going to, you're going to do what? He, he was like, yeah, I'm going to be a horseshoer. I'm going to go to horseshoeing school. And he was not pleased. You know, <laughs> we'd already invested money in college. You're right, yeah. So it's like, all that's just going to go away. It's be wasteful. And my father's not a very wasteful person. It's, everything is intentional. So he kind of, I talked him into it. He kind of went along with it, but he was very skeptical. And then I went to horseshoeing school and I just loved it. And as a student, in college, you know, it's like, you know, if I just got a passing grade, it's was, it was great. Awesome. <laughs> just getting by. But at shoeing school, when you would take an exam or when I would take an exam and I got one question wrong, it would bother me. And I'd go back to my dorm room and look it up. Why did I get this wrong? And I had never had that kind of passion before. And I love the forge and shaping and forging. And that was just amazing. So I just like just fell in love with the trade immediately. So I get out of school and my instructor said, hey, I know this guy in Baytown, Texas that maybe you should go ride with. I'm like, okay, great. I had no idea. I had no idea of, of the industry. I was st still so new in the industry. Well, he hooked me up with Kirk Cottle and Kirk had been on the American Farriers team. And I was like, what's that? And, and then he told me about the competitions. So I'm like, there's competitions? That's insane. I'm very competitive. I love sports. Uh, you know, I've played baseball my whole life, football and everything, and I'm very competitive. Our older brother, you know how brothers are. You know, yep. Yeah, have but to I be can beat you doing this. You yeah. Know? So I, I go ride with Kirk, and my first day with Kirk was pretty interesting. I had never been to a big boarding facility or something like that, and so they were shooting at this big boarding facility, and Billy Reed, who was another one of Kirk's apprentices, uh, was just finishing up his apprenticeship. He had done four years, but he was just kind of doing some day work with Kirk when he had big days. So my first day with Kirk, uh, it was Kirk and Billy, and we're at this really pretty big boarding facility in Houston. And as they started working, I just sat there amazed with my mouth open going, I, I thought I knew something about hmm. farrier work. Just, uh, I, I felt like I was the top of my class in <laughs> farrier school. And, and first day on the job with another farrier, I'm like, I realized how little I knew right. and how amazing and what craftsmen that these two men are. Mm -hmm. They tell us in about a month, we're going to be going to the Texas contest. So here's what you need to make. And so <laughs> and I'm going to enter in the student division and here's, here's the shoe list. Here's what you got to make. 
I set up my anvil in Kirk's shop and started practicing and they would give me hints and things help me. Uh, this is what they're going to be looking for. Here's how you should do it. So I get to the competition and, and I'm seeing all these farriers from all over the place and they've come from all directions. I'm like, this is mind blowing. This right. is, I can't believe this. They do this. <laughs> and so I do the competition and it, it's just excellent. And there's a clinic going on. One of the judges was Shane Carter. Oh, okay. And I didn't know any better. I'm just a you know, lowly student division. And so there's a clinic going on. And there's some other people that are forging in the background. So I'm like, well, I guess I'll, I'll practice a little bit. Because I, I thought what Shane was saying in his, in his clinic was way over my head. I, I didn't know really what he was talking about. So I was like, I'm just going to go over here and practice a little bit. And so I get uh, to practicing a little. And during the middle of the clinic, Shane stops what he's doing. And he comes over to me and says, you're doing it wrong. Let me show you. And he stopped his whole clinic to show me <laughs> this is the way you need to do it. And then he stopped and went back and started doing his clinic. And I was like, that guy just stopped what he was doing to come help me. That's crazy. <laughs> so anyways, long, long story short about the first competition that I didn't win it. It was very humbling. But I was like, uh, wow, but I'm ready for the next mm -hmm. one. When's the, where's the next one? So Got the taste of it. Yeah, and, and from there, I just was hooked on competitions and, and eager and hungry to learn and, and show me more. I couldn't get enough. Right. So then I, I get on a few more competitions and uh, start to know some people. And uh, I think my second competition was uh, the Oklahoma competition, and, and I think Grant Moon was judging. And I had to jump weld a, a frog plate into a keg shoe and make a straight bar. I, I didn't know that you could do such a thing. <laughs> and now you're going to put it in a contest where I have to do it. So I had, I'm like, I have no idea how to do this. So Kirk had to show me how to do it. And so I think I got it. I think I got it. So I'm ready. I'm ready. I've, I've made, you know, 20, 20 or 30 of these. I'm, I'm ready. I'm feeling pretty confident going into it. I have my go and I'm like, yep, I think I want it. I of course, I didn't go around and look at anybody else's. I just, <laughs> just saw yours. Yeah, I just saw mine. I'm like, it that's worked. beautiful. That's the best one I've made. <laughs> and I got beat. I was bummed. It's like, I can't believe I got beat. And it was by this uh, young kid who was younger than me, who was like just barely out of high school. Uh, that kid happened to be Austin Eden. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, being competitive, I was like, I got to get around that guy. And I didn't know him. And. So I decided to just make friends with him. And it's like, well, you got to know your enemy. You know, you got to know your competition. <laughs> right. So I'm going to yep. get in there and see, see what this guy's about. And, and from that moment on, Austin and I were friends. We were still friends. And, yeah. and I owe a lot to my competitive success to Austin Edens. That guy drove me. I chased him a lot. We, we chased each other. We, he drove me to be a better farrier, to be a better competitor. And, uh, yeah, so I owe a lot to Austin. And, of course, to the, my mentors, Kurt Cottle and Jim Port, and, and all the people that I've been on the team with over the years. Uh, the, all, I think everybody that I work with is a mentor. So I don't have just one. Yeah, I have some that are more important. But I, everybody that I've rode with, even if they, I didn't feel like their work was up to standard, I still learn. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm appreciative of that. Thank you all for helping me along the way. It does take a village. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> More for me, an army. <laughs> I'm pretty hard-headed, and I have to do things a lot. I be really repetitive to get good at something. But once I got it, it's, it stays. Yeah. So Now, how long did you compete for before you made that transition into the open category and then qualifying for the team? When I was working with Kirk, and I was probably... Division two, just coming into a division two category for competition. And that would be like intermediate? Yeah, basically intermediate. And I was still living with my mom and dad and traveling over to Kirk's was a, about an hour and a half drive and uh, across Houston. So I lived on the west side. Kirk lived on the east side. And I get a, a message, from my mom and dad, uh, you know, back when we had answering machines and no cell phones and there was a message glory days. that my mom left on the counter. It says, Jim Poor called. He wants you to call him back. It's not every day Jim Poor <laughs> calls you. It's like, what is going on? This is, this is crazy. This you know, world famous person is calling my house. Mm -hmm. so I, I couldn't wait. I was like, I got to call him right now. So I called him and he offered me a, a position uh, to be an apprentice uh, at, for him. Okay. 
without any thought, I just was like, yes, 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 I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> and and then after I got off the phone, I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to tell Kirk? Right. Yeah. Because I, I didn't discuss it with Kirk. I, I was just too excited. I was I, I, yeah, heck yeah, I'm not going to let this opportunity slip. Somebody else is going to take this if I don't. Mm -hmm. So I go drive all the way over to Kirk's. I'm in the truck with him, and I'm I'm just, I, I couldn't take anymore. I have to I have to say something. I said, so I said, Kirk, uh, Jim Poor called and offered me a position, and, and I, I should have discussed it with you, but I, I accepted the position. He goes, oh, yeah, I know. I'm the one who set that up for you. Oh. It's like, what? <laughs> it's like, so Kirk's business was kind of moving in another direction, and he always had a ton of people coming to work for him. So I feel like Jim could probably help you more than I could. I've, I've got a lot of things going on right now, and, and I think you should go. I think, you, I, I think you're ready for the next step. And so, so off I go to Midland. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was an eye-opening experience. And so we're practicing. They were practicing for the AFA convention. And here I am just barely in Division Two, And he's like, so they're going to have a practice that night. And uh, they were going to run the journeyman class which was four shoes, plain stamp shoes, toe clip fronts, quarter clip tines in 30 minutes. So they're getting everything going and he's like, go cut steel. I was like, I, I, there's no way. I, I can't do that. I can barely make a pair in an hour, <laughs> much less four in 30 minutes. He goes, well, you're dang sure going to try. Go cut steel. So it's like, okay, I'll try. I'm not scared. I'll, I'll try, but I, I know I'm going to fail miserably. Right. I got most of it done. I got a lot further than I thought I would. Right. I didn't get the hinds clipped, but I got the fronts done. And uh, I think I had the hinds somewhat punched, but I didn't get to clip them. And that was a lot further than I thought I could ever get. Mm -hmm. And so after about a week or two of doing that, I started getting shoes completed. And I was like, wow, that's amazing that if you just, you just set some goals that, that you think are unreachable. Right and you really try at it, you just might succeed and reach that goal. Yeah. So two weeks for me to get from barely making a pair in an hour to four in 30 minutes. So that just, I feel like, made leaps and bounds just in my competitive world. And so we go to a few competitions, and uh, now I'm, I have a lot more confidence in what I'm doing and conventions coming up. Well, they wound up not forcing me to enter, but encourage me to enter. <laughs> Strongly encouraging. So I entered. So I think it was maybe four months time that I had to practice. And mostly I was practicing that journeyman class because uh, I was, it's four shoes. You know, it was, it was a struggle to get done. I, I was getting done, but they weren't pretty at all. Right. So we go to convention and I, I get that class and I, I wound up like being like 26th place. And there was maybe 80 competitors. Oh, wow. So I was, I was blown away. I was like, these are some of the top hands and, and I placed 26th. This is in, very encouraging. So now I'm really got the bug. Right. And Bill Poor is just uh, a natural, talented person when it comes to Anything that Bill Poor does is just naturally good. And, and it doesn't take him long to, to become very good at something. And same with his dad, Jim. They're, they're both very, very crafty and, and handy. So I entered the Open, and like I said, I, I got like 26th place in the journeyman class. I didn't do very well in anything else. Uh, <laughs> that was the thing that I think I, that I had the most encouragement was is I had placed 26th place and that's not really all that great but for me it was a it was pretty neat it took me about from that point about four years to to place in AFA convention and I wound up tying for alternate that year so four years time is uh, how long it took me to get make the American Fairs team alternate and then each time that you attempted and, and say didn't place it just encouraged you to oh, yeah. go back I, and practice had, more. and Yeah, and I had, you know, a big fat lip driving home a lot of times, but I think <laughs> that just uh, that just drove me more. I think uh, some windshield time to think about what could I do differently or how could I prepare better, uh, and it just made me a better farrier. I think, you know, it, was, it wasn't the competitions that made me better. It was the practice time, the journey. The journey of, of these competitions is what made me a, a better farrier. And I feel like it just really expedited my learning process through competition. Mm -hmm. You can shoe horses and get better gradually, but I feel like if you do competitions, you can just 
speed up that process a lot. And right. if you're really just pushing yourself and, and I had a whole new respect for athletes and anybody that's a professional in their, whatever they're doing, um, the, the amount of time that they dedicate, I had a whole new respect for that. Now, what did that look like when you were decided, okay, I need to get better each time? Did that mean that you spent more and more time in the shop or? At that point in time, yes. Okay. I, I felt like, okay, I'm not, I'm not practicing enough. And like I said, I'm a repetitive learner. I have to do things over and over and over and burn it into my brain. <laughs> yeah. And then when I got it, then I, it stays there. I, I may have to dust off some things to, to get back, but I, I retain things pretty well. But I've done them enough that it, it should be burned in there it's pretty It's there good. somewhere, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which was unfair for like someone like Bill Poor who can make four of it. And I, okay, I got it. I'm done. And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, I made 400. <laughs> so how did you then build a business that's sustaining you and still continue on competing at that level. That part was a, a long journey before I was actually making, uh, you know, profitable money in the industry. Mm -hmm. I think it was probably around year five or six before I was actually making any kind of money that was notable or I, or I was saving some money. Right, yeah. And, and most of the money I made, I was putting back into my education and competing, buying bar stock, buying propane, buying tools. That was just one of the avenues I thought for myself that that was very fitting. I looked at my first week of horseshoeing school. I, I had to really ask myself, is this really what you want to do the rest of your life? This is this is really hard work. Mm. My legs feel like jelly. Yeah. My back hurts. And it's only the first week. You really want to do this all summer or the rest of your life? And I was like, oh, I'm going to give it a I'm gonna give it a try. Yeah. So it was about five years before I really was making any money that was notable. That was when I had I had moved on away from being an apprentice and started my own practice. I had a few horses here and there that I would go shoe just to supplement, you know, my income. Or I didn't make a whole lot as an apprentice, and I wasn't expecting to be paid a lot. Um, these guys were putting a lot of time in me, and I felt that was more payment than right than the cash that they gave me. And and the cash was just minimal. It was just you know, here's a hundred bucks. There you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> And during your apprenticeship, was there a lot of practice time incorporated into that? Yes. So that was, I think that was mostly like my pay, I guess, was like I had all the bar stock, all mm -hmm. the propane that I could use uh, when I was working for Jim. You know, Jim, the, the propane tank was, I was like a bottomless pit. I don't know. I never saw that thing get refilled, <laughs> but... We use that thing all the time. <laughs> and of course, the bar stock rack, you know, we, we did have to go buy a lot of bar stock. We, we burnt up a lot through. of yeah, steel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I said, I don't think I was really in it for the money at the time. I was just thirsty for the knowledge and, and I wanted to compete. I was very competitive in baseball and I moved my senior year. I feel like I kind of lost my place in the baseball world. I, I felt like if I, maybe if I had a state at that, I moved my senior year. So I played at a different high school and a smaller school my senior year. I was a four-year varsity for baseball, and so I, I was a catcher, and I was very competitive, in, and I loved baseball. But when I moved, the new coach said, well, what position do you play? I was like, I play catcher. He said, well, we already got a catcher. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wound up pitching and playing first base, two positions I had never really played. <laughs> right. So, yeah, so. so I kind of like, well, there goes my baseball career. No. So when it was season was over, I was like, well, I, you know, I'm a senior. I guess that's all done now. And I was uh, running an errand for Jim Poor one day in Midland. And I came across their Midland, I guess it's Rock Hounds, Mud Hounds. It was, some, you know, a minor league team and it, 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 they were having tryouts. And I just kind of pulled in the parking lot and I just sat there and I'm watching all these guys going in. And I'm like, what do you think the chances are I can just get a tryout? <laughs> and so I prayed about it a little bit. And. I felt like a smack in the face. It's like, you're living at Jim Poor's house. What are you doing? Right. Get back home and get back in the shop. This, you're already on your way. Right. You know, you've been handed this gift. You need to, you need to run with this gift. And, and so it's like, okay, so I go, go run the errand, go back home, light the fire, get back in the shop. And ever since then, my, my passion is like, you, this was put in place for me. The, and this is the path you're going to follow everything, all the, all stars lined up just right. You know, how did I land being an apprentice for one of the most iconic farriers in the industry? So, 
Yep. You Better just, get back to the shop. You stayed focused. I did. Yeah. <laughs> so once you ended up on the team, who were some of your teammates and what were those experiences like? So Austin Edens, of course, who we were traveling companions to, to these competitions. Right. Dick Becker, who was, he made the team uh, his first year at 55 years age. Oh, wow. So that was amazing. Yeah. John McNerney. I think Troy Price was on it that year. Uh, there's been so many different teammates that I've been on on the American Farriers team that I, I could probably write them down and if, if I had some more time to think about it. But uh, every one of those guys is, is dear to me. They, they've all taught me something. Yeah. It's quite a time commitment, isn't it? Because you, you have practices together. And... At the time, you know, single and didn't have a whole lot of responsibilities. So I, I I think I had a love affair with my anvil. And I, I had a girl tell me that one time, you spend more time with that anvil than you do me. I was like, no, she doesn't talk back. <laughs> no, I, yeah, no, I think I did. I did lose a few relationships for right. my passion. Yeah. And, uh, and then when I met my wife, she was very supportive and pushed me. And so that's what, one of the things that drew me to my wife is, is she's like, chase your dreams. Yeah, that says a lot. That's hard to find. Yep. So that's sort of the next stage you move into. You start having a family. Correct. How yeah. many kids do you have? I have six. Oh, wow. Okay. A big family. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I didn't plan that, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love having the big family now that we're, we have it. But, you know, I always thought, you know, I'll get married. I'll have a couple of kids like everybody else. Yeah. And becoming a fairy, I was like, you're not like everyone else. You know, you're a farrier. <laughs> Just the farrier is not an average person by any means, right? Yeah. Especially in conversation with just you know normal people. What do you do for a living? I, I, I shoe horses. That's crazy. Yeah. So it was kind of unique that you had this special trade or this special talent. Now I have a, a special family, and right. I'm not just your average. You know, I have two kids or one kid. And we have six, and <laughs> maybe more. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and how has that worked? You actually, when we first ran into each other yesterday, you were talking about the fact that you'd sort of stepped back from the the international competing. How has that transition been? Because you, it's impossible to balance it all. I have been on the team about eight years in a row, or an international team eight years in a row. And we had just had our second child. And my oldest came outside, and he was maybe two, two and a half. And he came outside with two gloves and a baseball. And I was just fixing the fire. And he said, would you play catch with me? And I looked at the fires going. Everything's ready to go. I'm about to push start on the time clock. And I just, if something just clicked right then. And I just shut the fire off. And let's go play baseball. And that was it. That was when it happened. Okay. Time to be a dad. Right. I mean, I was already being a dad. But I was like, okay, you can't practice for four to six hours every day like normal right and now you you need to i'll never regret spending time with my children mm -hmm. so i knew if if i had stayed with with as much competing as i was doing i i could probably look back and going you know i probably should have spent more time with my kids so i didn't want that to ever come up so the fire went off and this let's play baseball right. let's raise a family i've had my fun and now i'm gonna raise these children to the best of my ability and and it's kind of funny. I uh, I've had a lot of apprentices in between there, and they've all tried to get me to get back into competing. <laughs> They'd be prepping for a contest. I'm like, here, let me show you. And and I would just make some shoes, and they're like, how do you do that? If you haven't competed in years, and you just made some gorgeous shoes. And I was like, well, like I said, I I retain a lot. It just takes me a long time to get there. But once I got it, I got it. We haven't slowed down in having children, and so I was like, well, it doesn't look like we're slowing down anymore. <laughs> Maybe we can find some time to get back into competing. Now, my oldest are getting to be teenagers, and I kind of wanted to show them, you know, the competitive side of, of horseshoeing because it was so passionate and good to me. I would love to pass that on to my sons. Of course, yeah. So I've kind of gotten back into competing and, and maybe hopes that I can show my sons what it's about. Mm -hmm. If they take it up, great. If they don't, great. But at least the avenue's open. There it is. If you want it, I'm going to show you the avenue. You just turn down that street. So you're still playing the father role. It's Correct. Just in, yeah. Yeah. I think it's for just the next a, stage of their life, right? Correct. With having six, I feel like I've I'm like a repetitive learner. I've got six times. Right. I, I, yeah. I'm getting it down. Yeah, yeah. So now I can kind of maybe back off 
just a little and and do a little more competitions and it's pretty easy now when you look at after number six you know number one and two were hard for me as a dad and then when number three hit it we didn't miss a beat it's like yeah just throw them in the mix and right number four <laughs> just throw them in the mix five <laughs> throw them in the mix six we ha- we haven't even haven't even stops nothing you know slowing us down i feel like i've kind of mastered that not maybe mastered it but i've gotten pretty good at it <laughs> <laughs> right yeah and it's you know how do you love that many kids how do you and it's easy it's easy it's like i don't have any favorites i don't play favoritism to any of them it's, it's so they make it easy for me to love them oh, incredible <laughs> and then as we were speaking yesterday you said you are sort of ramping back up yes. what does that look like it's been challenging, uh, you know, trying to get some of the muscle memory back. Uh, I've been shoeing now for about 26 years, so I have some some ailments and uh, things don't recover quite as quickly as they used to. Uh, my hands hurt, my elbows hurt, and my back hurts, my knees hurt, everything hurts. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. So just kind of dealing with uh, some of the aches and pains of standing at the anvil and things like that, or, you know, swinging the sledgehammer kind of hurts a little more. And I've, you know, I've had a, a lot of apprentices that have taken a lot of the, the blunt force of shoeing. So I feel like the longevity of my shoeing career, I owe to some of my apprentices for, uh, I, I don't think I would have gone this long if I hadn't had help. So thank you, all my apprentices. I love you. <laughs> How many apprentices do you usually keep at a time? Is it just one at a time or... Yeah, some one at a time. Sometimes they overlap, but uh, maybe one's a little bit further along. Then I need to start another one, and I don't, I don't want to go too long without having one. I'd like to start one and let the other one kind of help him along and show him the ropes, where I'm not the one that's constantly barking at him. Mm-hmm. Uh, misery sometimes likes company. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm not saying it's miserable, but, uh, you know, you got to pay your dues. You're right, yeah, as you did. And, yeah, I think sometimes that gets lost on some people coming into this. They expect a lot more than they need to work for, basically. Yeah, I hear that from a lot of folks. So as far as getting back into competing in my family life, we had a, a family meeting about it. And uh, and so I told them that I wanted to get back in. And, and all my kids were very supportive. And they were like, yeah, yeah, do it, Dad, do it. My wife's very supportive. She's like, if it gets too difficult, then we'll, we'll reevaluate. And, right, yeah. But yeah, my family's been very supportive about me just kind of getting back in. And I, I'm easing into the competitive side. Like, you know, we're here, we're here at the greatest competition in the world and i want to be out there competing so bad <laughs> yeah it must be tough i'm only about eight months back into competing so i didn't feel like i was i was ready to compete at that level yet i'm, I'm getting there it's all kind of coming back and and the drive seeing all the competitors here is the is really got my I'm stoking some oh, fires man yeah. yeah it's 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 burning <laughs> <laughs> like, i can't wait to get home here we go we got things to do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think your kids, will you have them kind of come to the competitions and stuff with you? Yeah, they've, they've been coming to uh, the ones that I've, I've been doing. Um, I started back with a uh, WCB uh, finals in Fort Worth and okay. we made it a family trip and the whole family came out and they were very supportive. Then I went to Edgewood, which they did not come to. I think they were in school or something like that. I, I don't know. They had something going on and I'd, I went by myself and actually something had happened in between the time that I decided to get back into competing. I uh, took a position with Mustad. Yeah. And I was going to ask you that next. So nice segue. <laughs> that was a, an interesting thing. I was like, wow, things happen when you decide to do some things, you know, it's like all of a sudden here comes Mustad. I was like, whoa, man, this is blowing me away. So, and this is just as you started competing again. Okay. Maybe I had done one competition in between Mustad coming along. I was doing a clinic, and I was approached by Mustad, and, and the, the bug was put in my ear. And I was like, well, I'm not ready to quit shoeing horses yet. And I, that's why I was assuming that I was needing to stop shoeing horses and to do this position. So I kind of did a f- couple of interviews, and then uh, then they flew down and interviewed me, and, and they kind of sweetened the pot a little. And it's like, no, nope, we want you to continue to shoe horses. Yeah. Uh, we're going to try something different. And yeah, we want, we want a farrier. We want somebody who's full-time farrier to be a representation for our company. And 
to be a sales rep at the same time. Okay. So I cover four states. I cover Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, and New Mexico. And it's been great. And I have good relations with most of those stores and all those people. So I'm still learning the ropes. Don't get me wrong. And like, I am a repetitive learner, so I'm going to have to do it over and over and <laughs> right. over until I yep. get it down. But it's, it's been going great. Now for that, it, is that a fairly large time commitment or? It is. I'm trying to learn the balance because I am getting back into competing now. Yeah. Now the, some of the practice time has just been x made where I normally would have been practicing. Now I'm, I'm doing some mustad work. So I feel like the mustad work is something that's continuous that I do. Uh, I just, I incorporate it into my day. I start my day with doing some mustad work. I do most of my computer work in the morning and then, then I go to work and, and we usually schedule meetings in the morning. So I'll get meetings done and then I'll go shoot my horses. And then if I have time in the afternoons to make a practice, I will, or, or we may be going to baseball practice <laughs> right. so, or soccer practice or right. something. And so I just got to learn to sleep faster. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no kidding. Yeah. yeah. You could only double the, your hours in a day. But I, I will say I owe a lot to my work ethic, to the poor, to Jim poor. Right. He ingrained that in you. There's a few people that I know that have the same work ethic as that man. But uh, when I lived there, my bedroom was next to the forge room where the power hammers were. Okay. And I never had to have an alarm because <laughs> Jim poor would start his day off doing a blacksmithing project. Oh, really? That's just how he kind of got his mind engaged. And, and he would, so the power hammer would wake me up at 4.30. <laughs> and it would just basically bounce me out of bed. Boom, 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 boom. There you go. Can get up. <laughs> I never really got going at 4.30. Uh, you know, I was bang my head against the wall, get in the shower or something, and <laughs> get out there when I got out there. But, yeah, the, the, usually Jim was out there at 4.30. Yeah. I'm a little bit more of a night owl. He'd go to bed. I'd be in the shop practicing. He's like, turn the lights out when you're done. Okay. <laughs> yeah it's interesting how you have to find that time it's either at the beginning or the end of the day to make it work and sometimes you wish it could be both but but i like to do most of my shoeing uh, you know in the morning i like to start my day and let's get to work let's get let's get to shoeing let's get these horses done and then once my horse is done uh, all right now we're gonna do a practice if there's time or like i said baseball practice or kids soccer practice or something like that, or maybe work around the, the property a little if we got something that needs doing. Right. So I'll do that in the afternoon. I, I don't like to start building fence in the morning. That's like, <laughs> it just ruins my day. So I'll save that for the end of the day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now in your practice, do you do a lot of handmaids on the horses or is that? I do. I probably do more handmaids in cooler weather than I do in Texas summers. Uh, right. It's miserable. This summer was miserable. We've had a lot of triple digits this summer. So standing next to a forge just isn't <laughs> something that you enjoy doing. I mean, I, I still enjoy it, but it's it doesn't like me. Yeah. But uh, I'd probably say in the cooler months, I probably do about 40% handmaids and 60% okay. keg shoes. And yeah. in the summer, I'm probably like... I don't know, maybe 1% handmaids <laughs> right. uh, or I'm resetting all the handmaids that I had that right. were already on it. And I'm like, oh, it's, hang on. It's Who coming. coming? Yeah. I'll, I'll make you a new set <laughs> one more time. <laughs> yeah. Keep those on there. Yeah. But I enjoy putting a lot of handmaids on that. I, I, I feel like, you know, because I am very competitive in the competitions. I feel like I'm, I'm getting paid to practice. Right. Yeah. Is it mostly concave that you would put on? No, it's going to be in plain stamps, three-quarter fuller, fully fuller, concave, bar shoes. I pretty much would try to do a, at least a pair a day of, of handmaids. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and just put some handmaids on this one. You know, we'll just use this one as a, as a handmaid horse day. This is the horse you're going to shoot today with handmaids. And okay. I feel like if I do that, I, I keep sharp. Is it necessary? No, maybe, but uh, I enjoy it. And sometimes it, I feel like it does, it is more beneficial than uh, some of the kink shoes. Maybe it's a, a foot that's maybe a little wonky or has a in-between sizes type foot or something like that and get a little better fit. Mm -hmm. But I think if you can learn handmaids, it just makes kink shoes so much easier. Right. Yeah, <laughs> so, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So. Cool. Are there any soap boxes you like to stand on or just before we get into the short answer questions? or any advice that you'd have for somebody just starting out? I would never burn any bridges. 
there's plenty of avenues on the other side of that bridge. And it is a small industry. Always keep your options open. And who knows, another avenue just might pop up. Right. Uh, like it has for me recently. And I feel like I've been one of the luckiest farriers in the industry. Everything just kind of fell in my lap. I didn't, I didn't plan to be Jim Poor's apprentice. <laughs> Yeah, I had goals of being on the America Ferris team. I had goals of being on the WCB. And, and I think just the avenues that I took led me in that direction. I could have been all about making the money shoeing, but I'm pretty easy going. I'm not luxurious at all. Uh, I'll wear things until they got holes in where they fall apart. I'm, <laughs> I bought a pair of boots not too long ago. And, and I was thinking, I was like, I don't even remember the last time I bought a brand new pair of boots because right? I wear them until they, they fall, fall apart. Off. Yeah. Uh, and same with the shirts and pants. And I don't, I don't buy new jeans until the crotch is falling out of them. <laughs> <laughs> until they become so, inappropriate. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so money is, I've never really been money driven. I've, I've always been more, my dad was real good about being given attaboys, you know, and I think I live for that. You know, somebody slap you on the back and say, good job. Right. That, that, that's Drive worth you. more money than money to me. Right. Yeah. He taught me a lot, you know, playing baseball, never to really talk a lot. You know, don't brag. Don't, you know, let your actions speak for you. And so in this industry of being on the America Ferris team, being on the WCB team and all, all the things that I've been involved in, I don't have to talk. They, they, they speak for me. And so, and I, I still carry that. I, I'm, I don't like to brag and I let my actions speak for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I find most people who are really good at what they do, they don't need to brag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the bragging is usually compensation for right. something else. Yeah. <laughs> I think that a lot of young farriers today have a big advantage over some of the older farriers with social media and with podcasts like yours, an avenue of learning. Uh, we didn't have, you know, a clinic at the touch of your fingers. Oh, I'm going to watch a video on how to make some. <laughs> yeah. You would have to drive or go spend money to learn how to make these things. So you guys are blessed and be appreciative of the people that put content out because that was not available to some of us. Right. You had to really seek it out. You guys are getting something special. And, uh, also, too, uh, with this social media, things like that, and you get to read all kinds of comments that before before all this technology is here was never put out in public. And some of the things that I've seen and I'm kind of passionate about, I've seen a lot of uh, things about apprentices and uh, apprentice pay. I'm just going to put my two cents in. I didn't expect to be paid when I was an apprentice. I felt like the knowledge they were giving me mm -hmm. was my pay. Right. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah. Be appreciative of what somebody's teaching you. They, they are taking time out of their day to show you. So, and as much as you put in, it's probably what they're going to give you mm -hmm. back. Yep. So if you put it in, they're going to give you that back in return. Well, I, I was thinking that, as you said, about how everything aligned for you. I'm a big believer in you create a lot of your own you opportunities, do. right? You do. Yes. And and your luck because by being that good apprentice who wasn't expecting it but willing to grind right. to to learn, right. that just kept getting you those other positions. Like Kirk appreciated how good you were, so that's why he recommended you to Jim and right? So I think that that's an important lesson for a lot of people to figure out. And when you're going to certain events, whether it be a competition, a clinic, or something like that, I, I always kind of like do a little meditation and try to figure out what I want to accomplish and what I want to learn out of this. Mm. I was fortunate enough to be selected to go on the culture exchange with, through the AFA. Cool, yeah. And I remember sitting on the airplane on the way over there. It's like, okay, I'm going to be here for three months. What do I want to accomplish? What do I want to learn? I want to set some goals. Of course, I was just really heavily involved in competition. And so I was, I was thinking about my competition. It's like, where can I get, where, where do I need improvement in my competition? It's like my trimming. Hmm. I want to do better in trimming. So my whole, a lot of, not my, all my focus, I've had a lot of focus towards, I want to do a lot of trimming. I want to learn a lot about trimming, how different people prep feet and be able to see what they see. Right. And it's pretty amazing when you really work at it and just looking at other jobs, not necessarily even doing the trim yourself, but just 
I want you to trim this foot and then I'm going to look at it and then go look at another horse. And you can see the trends of how this farrier trimmed this horse. At the end of my three months, I could, I could distinguish farrier in between farrier to farrier. Oh, this guy trims like this. This guy trims like this. And, and I would have them when I would show up, uh, I would stay with them for about a week or two. And I would, the first thing I would say, I want to see you trim a foot and then I'm going to try to mimic it. I'm going to copy it. And then be able to switch in between farriers. Like, well, I'm going to trim this way for this guy because this is how he does it. Right. And I'm going to trim this way for this guy and this is how he does it. And then I can put all that knowledge in my, in my arsenal. If I need to pull out a different trim style, if something's not working for a horse, then some of the things I've learned from different farriers, I'm going to trim it this style, this way. Or, right. Or, so I, I got a lot out of that. And, and I highly recommend anybody that wants to go on the culture exchange to do it. It's one of the best learning experiences that I had. It was three months of nonstop learning. And you're out of your environment. Yeah, it's full immersion learning. <laughs> and there was no stress. The only stress I had was like, what kind of food am I going to have to eat tonight? <laughs> you know, I, I'm kind of picky. <laughs> And they have some weird things over there. They do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that was where the stress level was. Just, what do I got to eat? That, you didn't have worries of bills. You didn't have worries of, you know, social uh, girlfriends or anything like that. It was very stress-free and all about the learning. So I, I highly recommend uh, anybody that wants to do the AFA Culture Exchange to do it. That's cool. And go travel around. The, I'm, most, like I said, farriers are very giving. Call them up. Don't be afraid to call them up and say, hey, what's the chances I can come ride with you today or this week or something? And most of the time, though, they'll be very obliged to have you come. Right. Uh, yeah. I feel like farriers, so that they, they like to give away information because somebody gave it to them. Yeah, paying it forward. Everything that I got came from somebody else. Uh, there's a cute few things that I think that I kind of came up with, you but figured it out. Yeah, I figured it out. But I, I feel like some most everything that I do was handed down to me. So I do my best to try to hand it back to somebody else. For sure. This is the Stratum Tectorium. Short answer questions brought to you by Outwest Design and Fabrication. Your choice for farrier rakes. Outwest has decided to extend their $500 off a new rig rebate until the end of March. Just mention that you heard about it here to receive your discount. Conditions apply. The link will be in the show notes. What's your favorite book? Lonesome Dove, but it's also my favorite movie too. Okay. Yep. Not very often the movie is as good as the book. Right. <laughs> they were pretty good about following the book in the movie. Were there was they? A, there was a couple of things in there that I was like, oh, I did not know that because I watched the movie first. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Your favorite brand of nails. I guess some Mustang. of these will know where that <laughs> know what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> what shoe sizes do you generally have to stock the most of? One, twos, and threes I use mostly, uh, but I shoe a lot of big horses. I think I have more big horses than I do. Smaller horses. So I do a, a lot of dressage, a lot of hunter jumpers. I don't do a whole lot of Western horses. I do have some. I have some Western pleasure horses that I do. But um, mostly everything's a little bit bigger footed. And I actually like the bigger footed. It's, the, they're a little more magnified. And they, it's easier to see, easier to get under. I had some cut and horse farms that I've done over the years. And man, they're tight. Yeah. And it hurts my knees to get underneath it. And, I, and I, I can feel their bodies are tense and tight. And I'm like, you hurt probably as bad as I do when yeah. we get done. Right. So I like the bigger ones. Same. I And for those reasons. Yes. Yeah. The steel, like how, what kind of links would you be cutting to make handmaids for those typically? If uh, I don't carry anything bigger than a three. So anything bigger than a three would probably be... be 13 and a half, 14 inches on up. Okay. Uh, I think the biggest one I, I have right now is just that I don't have any draft horses right now. Thank goodness. But uh, <laughs> I do have some half drafts that I just recently got into my business. And I think they're one's at 15 inches and the other one's at 14 and a half for the fronts. Okay. And that's the biggest horses that I've got right now. So your back probably appreciates that. The one that I cut 15 inches, I put half by one on and the, the other one I put three eighths by one because I was... I was out of half by one. I would have put half by one, but I didn't. I ran out. Right. <laughs> Funny how that works. Yeah. 
Favorite make of Rasp? Heller. Okay. Do you have a specific model? I bounce back and forth with climate. You know, when it's dry, uh, I like the like the original Heller or Excel original mm-hmm. when it's dry. And then uh, when it's wet, I like the Excel Legend. This, it seems to be. And the Hel- the Legend puts on a really nice finish. Uh, the original is a little bit coarser finish, but it, it does really well. And then also the Red Tang has been, I, I've been using the Red Tang a lot here now that we're in a drought. Okay. And man, that seems to be like really working well on these brick hard feet. Oh, really? So, okay. And it's been retaining its edge. Okay. So I've been using a lot of those. But it's not as wide as the, the other ones. Right. But it seems to power through these brick hard feet. Okay. Right now. So I've been really using a lot of red tangs lately just to get through the hard feet. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, what is your dream ferry rig? I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Uh, I was the first WCB Stonewell Striker of the Year, and so I, I won a Stonewell rig with the WCB. I was the first one. And so I kind of designed that one, and I had two forges in it. And so I had a one-burner valley on one side and a three-burner NC on the other. So I had basically, like, I would use the one-burner as a reset forge. Right. And then the three-burner as a new new shoe forge. And I was just trying to, uh, like, like I say, I, I keep things a long time and I don't <laughs> replace them until they're worn out. Right. So I was like, well, with two forges, I won't have to replace these <laughs> as often. I'll reset out of this one. It'll last forever. Right. And then I won't have to replace the three burner because I, I won't be using it to do resets. Right. I would put two forges back in if I had a dream rig. I would put two forges in. And I would probably go ahead and add another anvil. Right. Because I, I always have a lot of apprentices, or not a lot of apprentices, but I always have a lot of people that want to come and go and ride with me and mm-hmm. things like that. And it's always easier to, if you got a big day to have two ambles. You're not in each other's way. Yeah. I wouldn't get too big. Uh, I like something that's a little bit smaller that's not going to, you know, be a total gas guzzler. But, but I do like to be able to carry things. If it was only a shoeing rig and not a personal rig, it would probably be a lot smaller. But, uh, you know, I'm sometimes I'm a little cheap and I'm like, well, my work truck is my personal truck, too. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it changes like, oh, well, the work truck bit the dust. So now my personal truck becomes a work truck. <laughs> and then I'm like slow to replace the personal truck. So uh, <laughs> but with having six kids, you have quite a few expenses. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so the, <laughs> I, I can understand that. So I would probably get something that uh, that could handle a crew of farriers, but also be small enough. That it's be efficient, right? Yeah, uh, fuel efficient, or you're something. not just giving so. all your money to the oil company, right? Yes. What's your favorite rounding hammer? Uh, my own. I so I have a line of tools that I make, and uh, I have a tool line, that, and, and one of the hammer, uh, the hammer that I make, the rounding hammer that I make, uh, is a two pound hammer, and it has a little bit smaller faces on it, and I found that the smaller faces I can displace metal a lot, like when I'm upsetting steel or bumping steel. Or when I'm driving a tool in, the smaller circumference seems to really drive the tool. It's not real great on like flat because uh, the face is kind of small. I, I, I have a three pound that I use for for like flattening because oh, really? it has okay. a real big face on it. And that, and that's actually made by Jim Poor. I use a Jim Poor three pound. But my everyday go-to is my own personal okay. two pound hammer. that I, And I like and I make it in a clipping hammer. And every once in a while I make some cross beans. But uh but yeah, I, I make the rounding hammer and a clipping hammer. Then I use both of those competing and in my everyday shoeing rig. Okay, cool. I didn't know that you made your own tool. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, it's been said on your podcast. Uh, I think you had Chris Deal on and you oh, asked him yes, that. And he's that's like, right. I You're use right. Todd Walker. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, hey, good <laughs> shout out, Chris. Love you, brother. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite type of bar stock to work with? Three, eight, three quarter. Yeah, I like that. It's uh. It's thick enough that you can do a lot with uh, five sixteens. Kind of, so you're limited on what you can do with thickness and the nail size. But I feel like uh, the tools that I manufacture they're great in three eighths and uh, half. And you really don't have to alter the shape of the punch as much when going from three eighths to half. It's just you just drive. It's just deeper, and then the nail size just goes up. So there's not a whole lot of altering to your your punches and fullers. But when you go to five sixteenths and quarter, it just throws a wrench in your tool. You gotta have a whole other set of tools for five sixteenths. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so I like three eighths the best. So it feels three eighths by one, three eighths three quarters, very versatile. Right. 
Uh, favorite pastime after work? I play softball for my church team, and uh, and I'm a big hunter. I like to hunt. Uh, I do a lot of whitetail hunting and uh, some, you know, dove hunting, quail hunting, things like that. I'm a, I like hunting. Okay. It's something I can do with my kids as well. We, they've gotten into hunting as well, so, and camping. It's, it's fun to spend some time with the kids in the woods. I feel sorry sometimes for my family because we'll make a vacation out of a farrier event. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if you raise them like that and and get them out into those kind of environments, I think you create better adults oh, yeah, too, definitely, right? Definitely. Yeah. I enjoy seeing kids at these things and you see them, they play around, but then you see they start to pay attention and... Uh, what's your the next thing on your bucket list? Uh, I don't know. It's been a whirlwind here lately, so I I got to set some new goals. <laughs> like just getting back to competing, I think probably that's going to be something that's right up my wheelhouse right now is learning how to get back in there and be competitive at an international level. I think that's uh, definitely want to be here next year at the at the World Championships. Looking forward to seeing you here. So, yeah, so <laughs> maybe that would be my next bucket list and something that I could work towards. And I found that going back into competing kind of gave me an, a little bit of drive. Yes, in your day-to-day -day work, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, farrier work, can, you can get burnout quite a bit. Maybe we'll save that for another podcast, but I've had some different things for burnout that have gotten me out of burnout. So, Like what? Going to a clinic or a competition will definitely motivate you. And if you've experienced some burnout, I know like right now I'm fired up yeah, because exactly. I'm here. Yeah. I'm like, I can't wait to get home and get in the fire. <laughs> yep. I found the same thing. Yep. Even just changing maybe the brand of shoe that you use or maybe changing a hammer or a different tool or, you know, buy yourself a new driving hammer and try that one out or maybe a new rounding hammer or a new clipping hammer or maybe, maybe even buying some pre-clip shoes. Just change up your, just get out of your funk change it up you know yeah we get stuck in ruts and it's i think it's the repetition that's not going towards something it's just you're just grinding it out i think yeah it, just switching a tiny little i just explained that to an apprentice the other day when if you're clinching for lots of people and it's all you're doing day in day out switch up your clinching method try the hammer clinching i hammer clinch all the time just uh change it up yeah exactly yeah it makes the day a little bit more fun, right? Yeah. And like in the shop when you're goofing off and something like that, you know, like some of my apprentices will have little competitions like we'll try every tool in the shop and have a clipping contest. <laughs> you know, I bet you can't pull a clip with sledgehammer. <laughs> oh, yeah? I bet you I can. And then you look kind of goofy over there with a sledgehammer trying to right. pull a clip. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, that hurt. <laughs> and maybe not the greatest clip, but hey, I made it work. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I bet you can't pull a clip with a driving hammer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, are there any other things that you kind of come up with? Yeah, I've got a hunting tool that I came out with. Uh, like, I'm, like I said, we're big into hunting. So I, I, I came out with a hunting tool and it didn't work out so well. I, I did get it to manufacturing and, and got it produced, but it wasn't accepted very well by the hunting community. It's still there. I just have to make some revisions. I've kind of not given up, just taking a break from it. Put it, put it on the back burner. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's your ideal number of horses to shoe all around in one day? Four. I think it changes with age, but... <laughs> uh, now, uh, did you experience the... How old are you now, if you don't I'm mind I'm 47. Asking. Okay. Did you experience at 40 that change that everybody talks about? Yeah, I think, I don't, maybe I don't think it was exactly 40, but it was in, in between 40 and 45. There's something happened there. Get a little more sore. Uh, and, yeah. yeah. It's like, what, what's going on here? Yeah. 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 Uh, Found the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, favorite anvil? I've always been partial to Coleswell. Pretty common answer. I think that came from... This competition here, because when they would have the world championships, they, they used coal swells, 200 pound coal swell. And so everyone had a coal swell and they're, and they're nice animals. I like them. They're, I like all the, the parts on them are really usable. Mm -hmm. I think they kind of went out of business and then the Scott Ambles came out and I really like the Scott Ambles and I use it. Actually, I, yeah, they came out with one that's very similar to the coal swell A1. Okay. So I like that one. And then now Austin Edens has yeah, one. I, I 
and purchased one I a couple months ago. I haven't got it yet, but it's on. I'm, it's I'm, on I order. plan on buying it. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's beautiful, beautiful anvil. And then my everyday shoe and anvil is actually a Canadian anvil. It's a Bowerman anvil. Oh, okay. And yeah. and I love that anvil to death. And mm-hmm. and I will never sell it. <laughs> it will be handed down to my sons. Right. I've been shoeing on it for well over twenty years. And it's still just as strong. The edges are still just as strong. There's a few little smiley faces in it <laughs> right, over yeah. 20 years, but the edges are still crisp. I, I Ed Bowerman, that is a kick-ass amble. <laughs> I love it. Thank you for making that amble. Plug to Ed. I skipped this, and I shouldn't have. Favorite brand of keg shoe. I like, currently, I've been, well, for, probably for about 10 years, I've been using the St. Croix Plus. Okay. When I apprenticed, Kirk used St. Croix, and so did Jim Poor. So I feel like just your mentors use these, you kind of use these. And, uh, and I've used everything. I, I don't, I'm not a, opposed to any shoe. I, I feel like it's uh, the Indian that makes the, the arrow fly straight or the arrow hit its target. Right, yeah. But, you know, here lately, that's just been something that I've been using is the St. Croix Plus and the Venter Plus. So I like both of those, but. Gotcha favorite inspirational quote uh so tony robbins and it's uh can i constant and never-ending improvement hmm yep do you have a farrier terrier i did for years i had a shoeing dog uh, her name was bailey she was a lo- little uh blue healer pit bull cross oh, okay and she was tiny but she was a perfect shoeing dog and the smartest dog ever and when she passed away i i told my wife i said don't replace it i i don't want another dog so uh, I, nothing could replace that dog. So I'm just not even going to get another one. <laughs> right. I'm just done with dogs. Yeah. Just, I, I, I had the best. Right. Yeah. No, I know that feeling. If you're stumped on a case or need backup, who do you call? Jim Poor. Uh, the, anybody that I've competed with or that were mentors. But I, I call Jim Poor. I call Austin Edens. Kirk, if he was still alive. Kirk always had an answer. And Billy Reed. Yeah, there's there's quite a few. Travis Coons was very, very helpful uh, if I have forging questions and horseshoeing questions, but uh, he's very, very handy in figuring out certain shoes. Travis Coons has always has been very helpful for me. Right. Okay, cool. Do you have a favorite shoe or package for a mystery lameness when the client either doesn't want to pay for a diagnosis or the vet stumped? I try to go back to basics. If I get a new horse that maybe has some issues, I want to start from ground zero and just shoe it normal and then move from there. If they will allow me to do that. Some people don't, they wanna fix it right now. If we can go to ground zero and then see what happens over that shoeing duration and then make changes from there. So I don't really have a go-to other than starting from ground zero. Let's go back and evaluate what's happening in the beginning phase. And I don't like to work on a lot of lame horses. I have done them in the past, but I like shoeing sound horses. a lot easier yes <laughs> a lot less brain fog that goes on with just <laughs> shoeing every day right normal everyday horses and a lot less bashing your head against the wall exactly and because what no one shoe fixes it you you put it on this horse and then you put it on the next horse and this doesn't work i'm like well that's terrible but some people really enjoy doing that so i, I don't know I, I like finding things that work and sticking to it right the repetition thing correct yeah uh what do you use as your planner or agenda I just keep a normal diary, pen and paper, and a diary on a monthly calendar. I, I, because I was born before technology, you know, <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I, think... I didn't even have a cell phone till I was 24. Right. I'm still not really, not real good at computers. They, they, I, I was graduated or graduating high school when the internet came out. Right. So I don't have a background in that. So, <laughs> so I, I feel like just old school things, you know. Right. I think my generation may have been the last generation that would come in when the street lights came on mm. you know it's, i don't know maybe there, maybe i'm wrong but i think the internet kind of ruined us yeah it, <laughs> it, it was supposed to fix everything but i'm not i'm not sure if it created more problems than it solved favorite method of soothing aches and pains probably physical fitness just staying in shape seemed to have helped my back more than than anything uh, that you could take orally, you know, something that you could numb the pain with, I guess, uh, whether it be a drug, alcohol, or anything. I, I felt like just staying in shape and walking for me has helped my back, or, or staying physically fit has helped my 
my body mo- more than anything. The, 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 yeah, you can you can take something for for a quick fix, but uh, longevity wise, I think just staying, staying physically fit. fit is, is and keeping your abs strong has really helped my back out the most. So you work out then? Uh, not real heavy. I, I like I say I play church softball, and okay. and my kids are involved in sports, and so. I help coach their teams, and I and I do all the calisthenics with them. I, I do laps with them. I, I I like to lead from the front, and I don't like to boss from the back. So I show them. I'm a, I'm not expecting you to do something that I wouldn't do, and I do that with my apprentices too. It's just I'm not going to ask you to do something that I wouldn't do. So I may add a few horses on here and there, uh, you know, to a day just to, you know because I have you. But right, yeah. I'm not going to plan a day that I couldn't do by myself. And, and I've worked with some figures that, you know, they, there's no way they could have gotten done if I wasn't there. <laughs> right. Yeah. So and I and I just take that on myself. I'm not expecting anybody to do something that I would not do. And and I, I feel like a leader should lead from the front and not the back. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, favorite genre of music or favorite song more specifically? Uh, it changes it, all the time. Uh, I like all music, but I, I think if it tends to kind of gravitate more towards a little country or something but I, I don't like anything new that's kind of been coming out lately so i like 90s country i'm, I'm stuck on 90s <laughs> country yeah, yeah. I, I think it's just probably because of where i was at in my life i was high school age and music's really important to teenagers and that yep. yeah and, and the so whenever i hear 90s country i'm like it just takes me back you know when <laughs> times were a little easier you know you're just a kid you didn't have any worries so but I like I I like to be soothed with some classical music and I like gospel music. I I, I don't really like to say it, it changes, okay. uh, but I don't have a favorite. Gotcha. Favorite drink? It was Dr Pepper, but here recently I've had to, I've given it up. Oh okay. So I'm getting older now, I need to start watching what I eat a little <laughs> right. more. Yeah so, yeah. Uh, I need to start cutting out some sugar. So Dr okay. Pepper had to go. No. Sorry, doctor. I know it. I yeah. love it. It's <laughs> nectar of gods. <laughs> <laughs> and it, all my apprentices know. That, oh, really? Yeah, yeah that was. And, a... and I chew tobacco too, so they're like, "All Todd needs is a Dr Pepper and Coke, and then he's good to <laughs> he's go. Full tank of gas, we're good." <laughs> yeah, all they're not going to believe me when they say I gave up Dr Pepper. So, yeah. <laughs> well, you heard it here first. Uh, what would you have been if not a farrier? I was striving to be a baseball player. So, I, but but you know, when I got to college and uh, knew that baseball was not something that was obtainable. My majors changed a lot in college, but I knew I wanted to do something outdoorsy. So I kind of wanted to be a game warden or a park ranger, forestry, something like that. Yep. So, and then the COVID question, who would you want to be stuck in a shop with for a month? In the shop? That's a hard one. I'd probably just say my mentor, Jim Poor. He still, to this day, amazes me. Uh, his work ethic and his... It's, it's almost genius like you know he comes up with new stuff i'm like it just never amazes me the 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 ideas he comes up with so yeah i'd, I'd go back and be with jim poor again <laughs> okay cool well thank you very much for doing this it's been a pleasure all right well i'm, I'm glad I've, that i've got to be a part of this and uh i look forward maybe we'll do another one sure <laughs> cool well thank you